G-Lock. No, that's not the name of a movie, or at least not yet. The question of the day is, is it a good idea to take a nap when you're flying an airplane at 650 knots, that's about the speed of sound, at 50 to 5 degrees nose low? Imagine you're screaming at the ground at the speed of sound. Not a big deal, right? Well, stick with us on Flywire as we talk about G-induced loss of consciousness. Hi, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to talk about G-induced loss of consciousness, what it is, what has been done to combat it, and why this might be important for general aviation and commercial flying. The data actually reflecting the significance of G-LOCK shows that an average of about 12% of jet fighter accidents historically, that's G-LOCK, is accounted for 12%, and back in the day when I first started, a, about 12% of fighter pilots had actually experienced it at some point. When I was in Nugget flying the F-4, G-awareness was a thing and it seemed that the F-16 was exploring a new frontier. I remember one year there were 22 F-16 losses due to ground impact. That is almost an entire squadron in one year. The airplanes garnered the nickname Lawn Dart. Fortunately, don't have that anymore. More work on G-awareness in particular required training in a centrifuge for aircraft cap capable of doing more than 6G. Something like a, it was a new anti-G suit system called uh, the Combat Edge that incorporated pressure breathing and a jerk and uh, something in your helmet too. Worldwide, there have been over 347 F-16 losses, 171 of them been CFIT, control flight into the terrain. G-Lock is a subset of CFIT. There's nothing wrong with the airplane except the pilot's taking a short nap or he was distracted and he flew into the ground. What is G-Lock? Okay. Well, when we're standing on Earth, we experience one G of acceleration. That is, the heart needs to pump blood to the head to keep oxygen flowing. And if you're human, some of us aren't, no oxygen means you go to sleep. In general, that's about a foot from your heart to your head. Which means that if you're pulling 5G, that is now five feet from your heart needs to pump blood to, head, to your head to get enough oxygen to stay awake. First your eyes grow out, then you black out, but you're still awake. You just can't see anything. And shortly after that, you lose consciousness, you go to sleep. Okay. From this graph, we can see that if you pull more than five Gs without breathing for more than three seconds, you're going to go to sleep. Your blood is still pumping, but it hasn't been oxygenated, so there's not enough blood or oxygen in your head. Of course, there are minor variations for physical fitness, smokers, injuries, things like that. But generally, you're going to G-lock in two to four seconds. And in World War II, the USAF developed G-suits for P-51 drivers, and those derivatives of those G-suits are what we use today. When I started, you learned how to do what is known as an M1 or an L1 strain maneuver, still do it, and this is basically a way of tensing your body and pushing against the G-shoot and then inhaling quickly every three seconds. This, there's an art to this and a rhythm to doing it. Lifting weights is, helps quite a bit, and surprisingly, running doesn't help so much. Fitness is important, but running itself doesn't help. Let's check this out. This is what a typical G lift looks like. Thank you. 
What makes a G-lock so dangerous is that you go to sleep for about 15 seconds and then when you wake up you have no idea where you are or what you're doing for about another 15 seconds on average. And that's, a, that's enough time for you to hit the ground when you're flying a fighter. In the F-16, that equates to 151 lives that were lost in CFIT slash G-lock. And this is the best data we have ready access to. I know of many others in different airplanes, and quite a few of them are friends of mine, that died in uh, ground impact. Uh, AFRL, the Air Force Research Laboratory, is working with Lockheed, and they come up with a system that monitors the airplane speed and altitude and vector, basically, and compares that with a digital representation of the terrain. If the competed vector impacts the ground, it activates the autopilot and recovers the airplane into a ground clearing path. Implemented just a few years ago in the F-16 fleet, not completely, even though it hasn't, uh, it has saved at least 10 jets and the people in them. I want to look at the HUD video of one save that is truly amazing. We're going to watch it all the way through the first time without stopping and then we're going to take it apart. so fast it makes your head spin. The airplane ended up in 55 degrees nose low and about 60, 70 degrees of bank doing the speed of sound. And it bottomed out at about 4,500 MSL and that happened to be less than 2,900 feet from the ground. At that speed, the ground impact was a matter of seconds. I mean, matter of seconds. Now let's look at it in segments so we can explain what's going on and you can see from the HUD video what's going on. Let's take a look at the HUD. Uh, on the left side, we have the very top, uh, the G. That's what the current G is. Next is the airspeed. You can see it's a ladder right now. It's doing 409 knots calibrated. And then down a little bit, it says SIM, and then 0.83. That's the Mach. That's the percentage of the speed of sound. Um, so we're going to see it crest uh, 1.0, so it's going to be doing greater in the Mach in a minute. Just to the left of that is the pitch ladder and the dashed is nose low. Solid is climbing above the horizon and dashed is nose low. You can see it's kind of curved uh, or slanted in uh, to a funnel and what that's doing is it's telling you that's the way to the horizon. Okay, it's giving you orientation to the horizon. But then the flight path marker is that uh, little thing that looks like a circle with the wings and a tail coming out of it and that'll move around quite a bit. You need to follow that because that's where the airplane's going. And we're going to see some interesting stuff from that in a minute. On the right side tape, that's the altitude tape. And right now it's showing 16,960 feet. And then right below that is the R box. It's blank right now, but that's the radar altimeter and that's the altitude above the ground, above ground level. It's kind of important. And here we go. Now watch, listen to the breathing. Very important to breathe in. He takes a breath. He starts the G, hits peak G about eight ish something. He goes to sleep right there. And that's the interesting thing. He didn't breathe for five seconds. Now the airplane's out of control. The nose is falling. The airspeed's picking up. You can see it's going to do almost 500 knots. 0.9. He's getting right there at the Mach. Five, 50 degrees nose low, he's totally asleep. He has no idea what's going on. And here, the lead is yelling at him to recover, and that is auto GCAS taking over, saying, okay, this guy's not flying the airplane, I better recover it before we hit the ground. And here's the recovery, the bottom out comes right about here, 
4,500 feet, and that's 2,900 feet above the ground. Close. And uh, it topped out at 9 Gs uh, totally. And the pilot was asleep right there, and uh, you could see that because it's still, he's, he doesn't have any roll control. He's starting to wake up right about now, and yeah, okay, what's going on, and uh, whatever, uh, but he's still not with it. He's not with it, and he's not flying the airplane yet. And he may be talking and responding to the radio, but he doesn't really. There we go. Right there is when he responds and he's totally flying the airplane. Totally totally and he's kind of trying to play catch up. So it took uh, about 40 seconds or so for this whole evolution to happen. All right, dude, climb back up above 12,000. All right. The system here is called the Auto GCAS, or Automatic Ground Collision Avoidance System. And it's going to be added to the F-35 and possibly the new F-15EX as well. And this is an amazing technology, and I'm sure that it's going to save a lot of future fighter pilots. And by now, I bet you're thinking, well, that is a really cool stuff, and that's an incredible video. And it's unbelievable how fast that G-Lock uses up so much altitude. But I'm also going to bet that most of you are thinking that it has little relationship to GA airplanes. Well, I think you're wrong about that. I hope you're wrong about that. CFIT is just about the biggest killer we have in GA, and adapting this technology could shrink that bucket, shrink those accidents. In fact, if you think G-Lock only applies to military airplanes, you'd be wrong about that too. There was a G-Lock crash, uh, as an example, in the air, at an air show in the UK a few years ago and lost quite a few people and killed and injured. And I personally lost a very good friend, Glenn Smith, flying an L-39 when he's practicing an air show formation routine. He had G-Lock. And it happens. Remember that graph? G-lock can happen at 4G sustained for five seconds. I'd be willing to bet it was a factor more accidents than we know. And it took dozens of accidents and deaths before the Air Force actually realized it was a problem. So you can imagine the situation in the civilian world. If you watch my videos, you'll know that I'm a proponent of training. I always will be. But I'm also a gadget guy. I had an F-30 in my F-33C and added a Garmin GFC 500 autopilot because it does amazing things. One of those is envelope protection. This is an early stage implementation, so it's not perfect, but it's a good start. Garmin has also tested the Autoline autopilot feature in a Piper M600 turboprop. That's pretty incredible. I'm not a forecaster, and I'm not the smartest man in the room, but I do recognize something important when I see it. This auto GCAS system operates in the most extreme circumstance and saves the jet and all on board. Smart guys can figure out how to incorporate in GA airplanes and airliners, and it may be that not all features can be adapted to GA, but the most important ones I'm sure will be, can and will be. And I'm sure it seems like, and it, and it actually seems like Garmin, Garmin is leading the way in this one, so kudos to them. I promise that I will do some videos when I take the GFC 500 through its paces, and the CFIT part of that will, will be part of that uh, evaluation. I hope you learned something and you liked the video. If you did, hit like and subscribe. It looks a bit like this here. And I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters here as well. Without y'all making these videos, it'd be a harder thing to do. If you'd like to support the channel, I'll leave a link below to the Flywire Patreon page. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Flywire.